Hello, everyone. I'm Josh Macauer. I'm the co-founder and director of Stanford Buyer Center for Biodesign. I want to welcome you all to our second installment of From the Innovators Workbench, um, a series really designed to bring to you um, the backgrounds and challenges and and thinking of real innovators. And we had the pleasure of having Dr. Kavita Patel last week. And this week we have an amazing innovator, Ann Wojcicki. Um, as you will hear, Ann is a true innovator in so many ways, having really being one of the first true digital health technology pioneers um, and really bringing um, this idea of prevention forward as a, uh, as, a, as a true company model. And I think it's fascinating. We're gonna hear all about that tonight. And I'm really thankful, Anne, uh, for you joining us. Um, and this is just in a broader perspective, both Kavita and Anne's um, uh, presentations are part of a, a broader uh, strategy for biodesign's evolution, both in the policy dimensions, as well as in all life sciences. And, um, and so these are, these are very thematic for where biodesign is gonna go. Um, by the way, for those that uh, tried to log in to Kavita's uh, session last week and for whatever technology reason weren't able to, the video will uh, be posted on our website shortly and anyone who registered was, is gonna get a, um, a link sent to you in your inbox. So have no fear, if you missed it, um, you will get to see it. And, uh, and just forward looking, our next speaker in the, uh, from the Innovators Workbench series is gonna be on June 2nd, uh, Ashley McAvoy from Johnson Johnson, who runs their uh, entire uh, medical technology business for J&J. &J. And that should also be a fascinating, um, a fascinating career to explore. Um, so I wanna thank um, MedTech strategist, Wilson Sincini Gudutrazadi, and Fogarty Innovation, Fogarty Innovation for their partnership in this event. And with that, I will hand the, uh, the, the uh, mic over to um, Andrew Cleland, CEO of Fogarty Innovation. Thanks, Josh. Um, I'm Andrew Cleland, as, I, as Josh just said, CEO of Fogarty Innovation, and we are honored to co-host tonight's event. Uh, this presentation of From the Innovators Workbench is special to us and is named in memory of Tracy Leprov, who passed away almost 10 years ago. Tracy was a giant in our industry. Many of you had the privilege of working with him, but uh, sorry, <clears throat> but for those of you who didn't get the chance, I'd like to say a few quick words. Tracy, along with his good friend, Casey McGlynn, really shaped our industry. He served in the Air Force after high school, then earned an accounting degree and rose to become the global managing partner of private equity and venture capital at PwC. Tracy was known for his remarkably insightful business advice and counsel. And I did say business, not just accounting. He was so much more. He counseled many folks who were and went on to become leaders in our industry. He was the quintessential connector of people, both at the professional and personal level. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to spend time with Tracy in my first CEO role meeting often at his table at Il Fanayo in Palo Alto. He was gracious, generous with his time and thoughtful in his advice. For someone who had achieved so much in his career, he remained remarkably grounded. He genuinely cared. In recognition of his impact and in his memory, we along with the Left Row Advisory Committee host a dynamic annual internship program where college students from around the country spend a summer living the MedTech startup experience. In addition, we have the privilege of co-hosting tonight's event with Josh and his team at Stanford Biodesign, the folks at Wilson Sonsini and MedTech Strategist. So welcome to tonight's show. It's gonna be fun. And let me hand it over to David Kasich to introduce our truly extraordinary guest speaker. Thank you, Andrew and Josh and everyone connected with this event. We're delighted and to have you here with us today, tonight to tell to talk to us about the 23andMe story. Um, so once you come up on the screen, there you are. Um, before we get to the 23andMe story per se, can you give us a little sense of your background, what part of the country 
you were raised in and what you did before you launched 23andMe? Sure. Yeah, I actually grew up right here. I have, um, I'm one of the few people who have that luxury of having um, grown up in the Bay Area. I, as a child, always feared that people would one day discover that it's so great and that they would drive up real estate costs. So I've always been interested in real estate because I kept thinking, like, why would you live anywhere else? And um, I think they and did I grew that. up. I grew up in kind of an unusual environment. I grew up on Stanford campus, so I was surrounded by um, a lot of academics who did not have nine to five jobs. And I would say probably most of them didn't have any business sense. Um, you know, my father studying particle physics and neutrinos, like it was not necessarily the most practical of skill sets. Um, and I, when I, when I graduated college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, um, you know, I first, I graduated and I first, um, I thought I was going to do an MD PhD program and I ended up temping, which is something I recommend to all young people. Cause it's amazing that you can get paid to go and show up in any, almost any job for three weeks. And you just ask lots of questions. And at the end of that, you can leave. And so my sisters and I all did this and I could go to, you know, I was in banking, I could go to law offices, um, I could go to dentist offices and I could see like, what is it like to actually work there? And lo and behold, I ended up on Wall Street. I ended up in a job investing in healthcare companies. And I-, I as, an, as an analyst or as an investor? As an analyst and then, and then managing money, like managing funds and, and money. Um, Were you pre-med or STEM or, or what, what it was, was biology? I was a biology, biology major at Yale. And I, and I was lucky. I worked with um, somebody who unfortunately just passed away, Sid Altman at Yale, um, who I always loved development of biology and I loved uh, molecular biology. So I, I had the great pleasure of, of studying science, um, but also very clearly recognizing that I'm not a bench scientist, like the level of detail that you need for that is not me. Um, but I, I just loved it. And I always thought I should go to med school and I couldn't find anyone who would encourage me to go to med school. So it was interesting. Like I worked at NIH for a while and I remember my, my physician who, um, uh, in, in, in oncology where I worked was just never supportive of, of that path. And so I, I, I always, like I said, I was looking for somebody to push me in a direction. And um, I didn't know that this world of investing existed. Like again, coming from the academic world, I didn't know that you could get paid to like study biotech companies all day long. Like I, and I, when I got the job, I didn't like, I still like, like to this day, I still have that sense of amazement. Like, I can't believe they paid me to do this. It was just so fun. Well, that's what parents are for, to push you into into med school. So yes. talk about the genesis, just in terms of ideas behind 23andMe. I know the Human Genome Project was key to it. What, what, what was it about the Human Genome Project that spawned uh, 23andMe? And, and was it obvious to you from the beginning, or did you toy with a, a bunch of different ideas? You know, I wasn't, I mean, I was inspired by like I took a year off and during that year off I actually took a class about the human genome and being sequenced um, and I always loved genetics like the the idea that you have a code inside of you and that it interacts in your environment um, and that most most things are you can have a risk factor but it's not deterministic like I just this absolutely has always captivated me like how your body works is absolutely captivating um, so I, the, the idea of 23andMe came about when, frankly, from the 10 years of investing, um, and frankly, like almost as, as I got to know the healthcare sector more and more, it became more of an insult about how healthcare actually operates. And I found that very little, very few aspects of healthcare are actually in, in my best interest, meaning like, I would like to just stay healthy, like I'd like to never use healthcare. And I found that almost no aspects of what I was investing in were about how do I stay out of the system? But it was a lot about how can I move from point A to point B? So there was a couple of things that kind of came together. One is I, I was investing in the human genome and like some of the early companies that were about that. Um, I also saw the fact that consumer voice had almost no say in it. Um, I was also very inspired at the same time by the HIV community that had actually acted up, you know, like their motto was act up and that they like as an activist community, like they'd made a difference in HIV. 
And it was the time Katerina Fake at Flickr who had kind of sat me down and explained Flickr and social and web 2.0 that you're going to have this connectivity online. And I started to realize that if you really wanted to ever understand the human genome, and if you wanted to have a different type of healthcare system, you have to actually have it driven by the people. Almost like a socialist concept of like by the people, for the people, we are going to understand what the genome means and we're going to make decisions about it that are actually in the best interest of people. And so, so you, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so 23andMe kind of came out of this idea is like, we're going to empower people. You're going to get access to your genetic information and we're going to crowdsource research. So the company uh, launched in 2006 and the first product was 2007. What, what was that first product? And the first how did product it, it form that vision? It was very similar to what we have today. You know, it's kudos to my product team then. It's actually, it, it's, it's quite similar. So we had, you know, some ancestry features. We had 12 health related reports. And, um, you know, obviously we didn't have any customers. So we didn't have any of the connectivity yet. But it was this idea that you were going to be able to look in your genome and see some of the ancestry features and, um, and you're going to be able to see some of the health. And it was so exciting. Our, our team of scientific advisors, which were very cautious before we launched, as soon as we launched the product, they just were like, you know, take off all the restraints. Like you should just give people more. Like we want more of everything you just put out. And, so what um, were the early marketing messages for, for 23 Me? What was it to, to your mind that drew consumers to the product and, and was the appeal to them the same thing that you were trying to accomplish or do you think they saw something different? You know, I mean, the, the origin of Federal Express is that it was an, an organ transplant uh, company and became something very different when people began to tap into it. What, what do you think people, what were you telling people 23andMe could do and, and what were they really signing up for? Well, that's a very good question. I would say we had no marketing plan and our sales were reflective of that. Um, so we launched really with this idea that it's just interesting. You know, you're going to get your human genome and you are going to just explore it. And we had almost a very academic approach, like you're going to be able to look at different parts, see where it comes from the world. You'll be able to understand all kinds of different health risks. And in some ways, like it's, it was hard to do marketing analysis ahead of time because people never knew what it was. You know, it's like looking in the mirror for the first time. If you haven't, if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to even describe like what, what is it that you're going to get? Um, so we had a big jump on our sales right when we launched and then, and then it was almost like a flat line. It was pretty dismal. And, you know, that was very clear. Like, what is the value proposition? Like, why do people want it? And probably one of the hardest things for us is that we, the medical community was absolutely against everything we were doing. So, why is that? well, I think that there's a couple, I think there's a little bit of protectionism that, you know, this should go through a genetic counselors. It's not necessarily um, like people should not necessarily have access to this. It's irresponsible. People won't know what to do with the information. It's going to be, they need guidance about it. In my mind, it was a very paternalistic approach. And in my sense, I said, look, it's my, it's my DNA. Like, how can you tell me I can't look at like what I have? And I'm just comparing it to public literature. And so the reality as well is like most physicians are not trained on genetics. And so it, it reminded me of, again, again, from my investing experience, the WebMD days when doctors were so agitated about WebMD. And like, how could a patient come into me and like bring me a list and say, you know, here's what we think you know, I have. Um, so it reminded me of those days. And, you know, the reality is I think people should have access to their own information. I think if you ever really want to change healthcare, you have to be more of a partnership rather than a paternalistic dictatorship. So oh, things like Web, WebMD did kind of start this uh, cultural change where people went in and asked doctors about what's going on. If you, if you see drug uh, advertisements on TV, they say, go in and ask your doctor. And it wasn't always well re received by physicians. Um, were, were, 
was 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 there a, was there a sense in, in what you were doing that um, that people were making that connection between genetics and health as opposed to say ancestry? Were there any predicates that you were that you were modeling your business after and saying, well, that's that's successful. People like doing that, so we can we can build on that. Or were you kind of sui generis? I would say, again, part of the challenge we had at the business in the beginning is that there was no predicate. Um, because most, if you think about, like you get diagnostics in other, other ways, like you can get all kinds of other genetic tests. Like if I, even my son, I did genetic testing, but it's not, I don't even think, I don't even think the report was returned to me. So like, it wasn't an experience. It was like a group of people at the genetic counseling center, like sitting down and talking to me about it. So there wasn't really any kind of model for what we were trying to do. Um, so we didn't, we, we certainly did not say like, hey, we are trying to model ourselves after that. Um, and I think the thing that's interesting about DNA, I one day just spent the day sitting in Stanford Shopping Center, listening to people's conversations over the holiday season. And it's remarkable how much people use genetic phrases like, oh, my sister and I, like we're, like we're similar, it's genetic or like, oh, it's like, it's so many ads even say like, it's in my DNA. It's remarkable how much people talk about DNA, but they don't really know that much about it but it's part of our vernacular. Like we absolutely, I mean, ad campaigns all over the place are using DNA. So people do think about it as associated with their health. Like overwhelmingly when we've surveyed people, they think about it more associated with their health. I think the surprise that came for us is when there was enough critical mass and we had more of the data, the ability to tell you details about where you come from, like all of the autosomal analysis that we did um, and we were the first company that put that out, like that was a huge hit for people. And I think it was, it was that kind of self-exploration. And I think the number one thing that we recognize is that we were tapping into a sense of identity and we did not necessarily expect that we were going to be influencing identity. Yeah. And people really bought into that, or, I mean, maybe it wasn't, they had not thought about it, but suddenly that appealed, that appealed to them that they could find out something about that was really important to them that they'd never thought about. A hundred percent. I mean, just people, a lot of people come with a, a assumption about like, Oh, I'm a hundred percent Jewish. And then they find out they're 95% Jewish. Like, so okay. um, before we get to, um, uh, I want to get to the finance because that raises interesting questions about financing company. I, we should point out that while most people think about 23 Me as a consumer oriented a tech company, you do have a research side. What, what is the research side of the business? Well, we've all, what's, what's interesting about the company is we've always had this research mission and it makes us very different than all other tech companies because from day one, I hired, like my third employee was a professor who had a huge background in ethics. And so we've always focused on like, how are we going to consent people appropriately how are we actually making sure that we're setting everything up so that you have a research infrastructure, people have the ability to say yes, or people have the ability to say no. So research has always been part of the idea since day one. And also because we all have this, you know, all of life is based on the same genetic code, but we have no idea really how it works. And so the only way you're going to figure that out is to crowdsource all this data and any one institution, Harvard, Stanford, you know, even some of these national initiatives, like it's going to be hard. Like you need hundreds of millions of genomes to really start to make sense of a lot of it. So you have to crowdsource it. So that, that raises an interesting question. So you, you're developing something that, that has an inherent appeal to a lot of people, but not many people have really actually thought about it or, 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 could envision or articulate, how did that affect your fundraising? I mean, who, what kind of investors did you go to? Did they get it? Was this too out of, out, out of left field for them? What, what was the response to investors and what kind of investors did you approach to fund 23andMe early on? We went, I, because I, again, I come from the investing world, um, I was very clear that there's certain investors that we, we want and there's some investors we absolutely don't want. And I want one that's more willing to go high risk 
and recognize that like, you're creating a whole new industry. Um, I feel very grateful. We had Patrick Chung, who was at NEA, um, who's now at X Fund, was an, like came in last minute, was an incredibly supportive. Um, we had Google Ventures that came in as well. Um, and it was interesting because also as we pitched, it was one of the things that we also learned. Like we, as we pitched, then other companies also were started to copy. So like Navigenics was a Kleiner Sequoia company that, um, you know, came out sort of out, out of somebody doing diligence on, on what we were doing. Um, there was another company as well. So what's interesting is like, it was, it was definitely seen as like, you know, there's, there's something interesting to do with genetics um, and how are you going to do it? And we were very different than the, the competition out there because we were direct to consumer. We did not have physicians and like our main competitor, Navigenics, they had a physician oversight. What, what, what was proprietary about what you were doing that would appeal to investors sense of not only is this a good idea, but 23 and me owns it. And, and it's going to be extremely difficult for anybody to copy them or challenge them. Well, I think there's going to be, I think what the pitch that we had was the, the approach in terms of being direct to consumer and the first mover advantage on being able to get insights from the data and specifically looking to build a research and a data team to say, we're going to aggregate this, we're going to make insights, and then we're going to give that back to the consumer. So part of the differentiator, like the core differentiator of 23andMe today is that we have this recontactable community. So we go back to our customers. That's how we keep learning. We keep iterating on the product from that. So it's, it's, it's a totally alive and dynamic community and there's nothing else out there that's like it. So was it, was it, um, uh, was it easy to build that? What were the tech challenges or the product development challenges in, in getting that early stage going? Was it simply getting consumers to sign up or were there, were there other challenges in putting the, the offering together? I think the thing that surprises me the most is how, um, in some ways, how well everything has worked. Like technically, I remember the first time we actually saw that you could get a parent and a child and that you could actually see like, wow, that's half of your DNA. Like the first time we saw that, we're like, it, it works. Like it's, it's amazing. So we're eternally grateful to Illumina, which has the chip that we use. Like that chip works incredibly well. Um, the other thing I'd say that it has always amazed me is how well the research system works. Like one of the main things that we pioneered was self-reported data. So we don't take a medical record. And I would say most of traditional research today is based on the assumption that it has to be in structured clinical trial format. And we do not do that. Like we do not, we actively do not want medical records. Um, I'd say the biggest why, thing- Why do you not want, why do you actively not want medical? Because they're so dirty. They're so bad. They're, they're like, there's no consistency. Stanford to UCSF, you can't even agree on gender. There's no consistency. There's all kinds of missing, there's all kinds of bias. There's all kinds of missing data in it. Um, it's, it's, you spend a huge amount of time cleaning it up. But what we find is like, when I ask you, and I ask you for structured data, and I ask you about, you know, are you a morning person or a night person? It's like structured. And I can ask you, you know, like, do you have asthma? I don't need a medical record to pull out whether or not you have asthma. Like probably no. And everything, like the hypothesis again of the company was that size swamps everything. So like just grow. Like the thing, the main thing that we did that was also very different than our competitors is we were, we're, we're, we're a data company. Fundamentally 23 is a data company. We're not just a diagnostics company. Like we're data. And so we, we optimize for low cost and volume. So is there a critical mass aspect to, to your business? In other words, it, it works really great when you have. I used X. to say that at a hundred thousand oh. and then I said a million, um, you know, at a hundred thousand, I remember, you know, Art Levinson even from Genentech coming over and saying like, when you have a hundred thousand, like, wow, you'll be able to do some crazy things. And then and he was right. And then we were like, let's go for a million. And then at a million, we said like, wow, we can really do some crazy things. At 10 million, um, you have the ability, we have so many people that you have disease representation in pretty much all of the phenotypes that you want to be studying. 
And are you global or? Uh, we're global. We're global. We're, 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 you know, 20, roughly 20% of the company is outside the U.S., but we are, I mean, we're predominantly a European data set, but we are also the largest non-European data set that's out is there. Is it proprietary to ask you how many uh, lives, approximately not, you know? We have over, different? yeah, I mean, now that we're public, we are, everything's proprietary, like, but we're yeah. over 12 million. Okay, that, that's fantastic. So I want to get into some more aspects of the, of the story. So before you do that, to your mind, how, in, how uh, closely linked are the research and the consumer side of business. I, I mean, I, I, both in terms of appeal to customers come in, but also to the to what you're trying to accomplish at 23andMe. Are they two se totally separate businesses? Are they two inextricably linked businesses? Can they totally exist linked. side by side it, without it's, interacting? It's one, it's one thing, it's totally linked. And it's interesting, like investors used to often ask us, like you should chop off that consumer side or chop off the, the drug discovery side. I said, like, you can't, like, it's, it's like chopping off one of your legs. Like the way we walk is by having, you know, two, two legs. So the two are incredibly related. And when I think about even the engagement I have with my customers, like why people come back, they come back because there's new content, there's new relatives, there's new content. And we get the new content because we keep doing research. And what I find as well is everyone Everyone always asks, like, there, like, there's no such thing as healthy. Like, everyone's on a spectrum somewhere between being born and being dead. And you, everyone has a condition. Like, you could have asthma, and it's not well treated, and you want to do research on it. So we find that one of the things that 23andMe does is we engage people in the fact that everyone has questions, and everyone is aspiring to have better health. And so when we ask people about, you know, if, if we know, for instance, that you have Crohn's, and we target you with a survey and we say, let's learn more about it. People are really motivated because they're suffering from that condition. So you launch in 2006 mm -hmm. and seven years later, the FDA comes to you and says, wait a second here. Can you tell us what the FDA was, what they, what they said to you and what they were concerned about and, and what the issues were that they were, what they were raising with you and how you manage through that process? Yeah, I mean, the FDA is a complicated story because it's, um, you know, there was absolutely a time frame. like 23andMe actively said, we are going to engage with the FDA and, um, and we did our best. And clearly our best was not enough. And I think that there is absolutely some of this, um, you know, disconnect that's in Silicon Valley. We didn't necessarily have, like I look at my investors, everything we did, I didn't have any of the FDA, FDA regulatory expertise. And as much as we had engaged with the FDA, we just were speaking a totally different language. Um, Did you think the FDA really should not have been looking at 23andMe? Or, I mean, did, were you working on the assumption that you were playing in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area that FDA really had no authority and expertise in? Well, we were making the assumption that we were told I mean, it's like, there's very interesting aspects of 23andMe. Like, like even in the early days when we applied for IRB approval, we were then rejected because we were told we're not doing human subjects research. Um, when, when Von Eschenbach was running the FDA, we met, we met with him and he said, and with his whole senior team, everyone from the, F the senior leadership there, under no uncertain terms, will we be regulating 23andMe? So, at the reality is like under a different administration, it was very clear. 23andMe is about freedom of information. It's your genetic information. We're connecting literature. Like it is not a medical device. And things really changed under, you know, Obama's leadership. Like it was now like 23andMe is absolutely a medical device. But I just have to point out that 23andMe is really the only, you know, direct consumer initiated test that has gone through the FDA. Someone suggested to me that it was your appearance on the cover of Fast Company magazine that kind of elevated your profile to FDA officials. You seem to suggest it was a change of administration, but I wonder yeah. whether it was a kind of awakening on the part of the FDA that the, maybe you ought to take a look at this. Well, the, the, the cover letter, what, 
the the cover was literally three weeks before the the the, the warning letter. So it was. I have no doubt that the cover helped push, you know, pushed us off the edge. Um, but it was, like I said, if you look at the time frame of it, it's like when we started, and even you know Kessler from UCSF, who was the also the administration, like he was one of our earliest advisors. Like we'd worked with multiple individuals who had sort of concluded we are not a medical device. Um, so what did the FDA want you to? Do? I mean, what were they? What did they want you to demonstrate or prove? They wanted us to go through the medical device process, and they wanted us to go and validate that. Um, do two things. They wanted us to validate that um, the test is accurate. And so, like, if I'm calling an A, that it's actually an A, and that when I'm delivering a report to you, that it's actually an A. And then I had to prove out that you could understand it. So I had to do comprehension. So, so an analytics and then comprehension. And so I brought up the point about the other companies because you have lots of other companies that are out there now, but they are not regulated. And so I do think that there's always an interesting question about like sometimes being early, you get yourself, like we are regulated, but there's no one else who has gone down this path. Is that, do you think that's because the FDA having had you go through the process, realized that, this wasn't really ne- we. This wasn't really necessary for what these products are doing. I think the world has evolved <laughs> to realize that there is um, not like the theoretical harm has not um, and out. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's also there's the LDT path that has become sort of a bypass. And I think it's always a question about whether or not that is going to get regulated or not. But my main point is like, there's lots of other companies like when, you know, back in the day, like one of our competitors put out a, you know, breast cancer analysis panel that like we would never put out. Like we looked at that as saying like that is irresponsible. And, um, and it, it comes out. So the reality is like the world in some ways, like everything that we did was seen as very shocking and, um, and then frankly, I have to say, I'm grateful for the FDA process now. It's made us a much better company. And I, um, it also sells to the medical world. Like now when people question it, I have all kinds of data in spades that I am accurate and that my consumers can understand it. And I think one of the best things that came out of the FDA is it did force us to prove that very complicated concepts like your APOE4 results, like your Alzheimer's results, like people can get this information and they can understand it. People can get a pharmacogenetics report, meaning like, do your medications change with it? They can get it and understand it. So again, for me as 23andMe as an advocacy company, I feel like we advocate for the individual. And frankly, the medical world looks at all of us as being totally incompetent of taking care of ourselves. And part of like my like rebellion against the system is like, people are not as dumb as they are hypothesized to be. And so we so, have to prove that they are not. So someone said to me that it was an existential turning point for, for 23andMe and you had to rethink your product. What, did you, is that true? Did you have to rethink the product and, and, and did it, was it a real threat to what you were trying to do or was it just pro forma, we have to get through this and we, we, we yeah. know the pathway? I mean, well, like we are, like when those moments that we got the warning letter, it was very clear. And like, once we developed the strategy and we hired a phenomenal um, head of regulation, Kathy Hibbs, who, who put us on that path, but it was very clear, this is going to be a very long road. And I remember actually, it was one of the heads of um, the regulatory team at Genentech. I remember it, it was a woman sitting me down and saying, do you want to sell this company? Like, you want to sell this company, you can sell and just like dump it, like you're done. But like, if you want to really change the world, like put your head down and go through the FDA process because that's how you're going to prove that like direct to consumer is a viable path. And, um, and that's what we've done. And to be honest, you know, we're almost we're at t- like 2022, the work that we're doing right now, like we just recently acquired a company, Lemonade, a lot of the stuff that we are working on now is what we were working on in 2013. And so it's almost taken us nine years to climb out. So we're a much better product. So the product has not changed. The product has gotten much better, but 
it's a lot of um, it's, it's iterations on what it was before, but it is, it's the same foundation, it's health reports, it's ancestry, it's the connectivity and all the things that we thought about in 2013 about like, how do you actually now get this into care? How do you actually help people use it? How do you make sure that in pregnancy or surgery or, you know, in other specific needs that people are getting the right information? We're at that point now where we're saying like, now we can actually go and do this again. So I, I want to stipulate before I ask the next question that I recognize there are enormous differences and, and very meaningful differences. But and I may have the timing slightly off, but I wonder whether there was any fallout, particularly around the FDA, for the Theranos story as you were living through what you were living through. Obviously, very different. That was a story of fraud and someone who really just didn't have a handle on what she was doing. But we had John Kerry, the Wall Street Journal reporter, who, uh, who broke the story and eventually wrote the book at one of our conferences. And he, he made a point, which not everybody in the audience agreed with, but his point was that there's something about the Silicon Valley culture um, that becomes very dangerous when, med, when, when you get into medical areas. This, this notion of fail fast, fake it till you, till you make it, get a product on the market, test it out, and then see if there are bugs that needs to be worked out. I, I wonder if anybody looked at either at FDA or maybe even outside of FDA, looked at what you, what 23andMe was doing and say, well, you know what, we, we just want to make certain that this, is, this doesn't become another Theranos story for us. Well, I think I have a lot to say on this. So first, 23andMe in our process, like we have definitely never faked it till we made it or like run fast and broken things. And I think, again, going back to what I said in terms of the, like how we hired, like the first team of people I hired were my scientists who were saying like, how are we going to build this thing in the right ethical way? How are we actually going to make sure that this is appropriate? Um, we've always stated that we have no company if I don't have the support of the scientific community. And so the difference, like when I think like the biggest picture terms, like 23andMe has hundreds of publications. Like the core difference here is like, we are a scientific powerhouse. We've always, like I've had an incredible group of scientific advisors I hired, again, the, the, the scientific team that built the company. We were admittedly incredibly weak on marketing. But like the reason why the FDA did not tell us we could not return our reports or we had to revoke reports from our customers is because fundamentally we had support of the scientific community. People knew that 23andMe was a responsible company and that we were actually returning valuable information and accurate information back to our customers. So, so I'm sorry, go ahead. No. So I was saying there's a level of obedience. Like we did not necessarily follow the path. We were not following all of the rules, but I think the scientific credibility of the company was never questioned. And I said, the reason why you mentioned that cover, the reason why I started doing press, because before that year, I never did a lot of press and one of our number one um, nemesis was somebody named Ewan Curry at the CDC. And Ewan was super critical of us. And there was one day where Ewan actually retweeted a quote, an article about 23andMe. It was like one of our papers. And I went to my team and I said, we made it. Like Ewan Curry, who couldn't stand us, like he actually publicly said something nice about us. I was like, we've like, we're winning over our critics. Like the first five years of the company, like all I wanted to do was like go and meet with people who couldn't stand us and try to win them over. It was like really like man on man combat here. Like there was a Wonder Woman element of like, you hate me, like tell me, let's like talk about this. And so um, it just, it was a very, very different, like I said, everything about this company was built on the scientific foundation. And there's like a, there's the most controversial aspect for me is the direct to consumer. Like we are making the assumption that you do not need 
a medical provider. And that is wildly controversial. It's not how the healthcare, the $4 trillion healthcare system works. So for, to your, one, one more point, to your mind, was the FDA episode a speed bump? Was it a, a, was it a detour? Was, did it force you to go back to the drawing board? What, what was the- what I would say the, it was like a really large mudslide. Mudslide, okay. So let's- It was, let's, like, <laughs> it so was let's, a mudslide and it took years to rebuild that road. <laughs> so let's talk about the research side of it because, you know, you, you're talking to a community of folks who are in the medical device, in the product area. This whole area of consumer health is, is you know, somewhat alien to everybody. Tell us about your research project, how, how closely linked it is to the consumer side. And I know you've got a couple of drugs under development. What, what, what are those? Well, I think... I mean, for me, the genome, like I, I, like I've like, again, this is a group of scientists, like, doesn't it keep everyone up? Like you have this code inside you and you have no idea how it works. Like your body is like, like working so hard all day long, all night. And you have no idea how it's like all operating. I think that's just amazing. And the fact that there's this spectacular human diversity and some people are, you know, phenomenal at math. Some people are phenomenal at running. Like, I just think it's so interesting. So the way 23 works is we ask our customers if they want to participate over 80% of our customers opt in and we ask them lots of questions about them. And anytime something is interesting in the world, we just ask a question. We like put it out. We have these things called quick questions and we just put out individual questions and our customers love it. Like they take lots and lots of surveys and we run these massive analyses on, it's called genome-wide association studies and then phenome-wide association studies. And you can look at, you know, all kinds, like what are the genes associated with different phenotypes? And then you can put a, you know, hold the, the genes constant, say looking at this gene, what are all the different phenotypes associated there? So we can do all kinds of analysis. And so every... Um, few months, every six months, we do this huge run and then we start to analyze the data and you can see like, look, this is associated with, um, you know, asthma. This is associated with heart disease. This is associated. And, and then we have a whole process now of either looking at it and saying, is this something we're going to give back to our customers or is this something that could turn into therapeutics? And so, for example, for our customers, we now do these reports called polygenic risk scores which mean I'm looking at hundreds or thousands of mutations that add up into a score. And I give that back then to our customers. And so all common disease, you can essentially start to have these, these you know, risk scores. And then for therapeutics, there's all kinds of really interesting targets. And so by studying autoimmune conditions, we actually found some um, immuno-oncology targets and that's actually now what's in the clinic. So you've got two of those in the clinic right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that going to be a special focus? Or it sounds like given the nature of 23andMe, you have tremendous data that could lead you in any direction. Or will you specialize in immuno in, immuno? No, we, we're, we're kind of in an interesting, because we have so many phenotypes, we follow the data. We don't follow the phenotypes. And that's actually been one of the big issues is because like one of the reasons why we partnered with GSK, GlaxoSmithKline was specifically because we needed to have a large global partner because we have so many different phenotypes. So we needed somebody who could actually come in and step in and, and bring a lot more capabilities than we have. So, uh, you know, drug discovery, development of a drug that actually makes it to market is highly risky, takes a long time, takes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, am I right in thinking that the potential of the immunocology of the drug business is, is greater than or culturally significantly different from the consumer side? What, what to your mind is the balance of managing those two different businesses? Oh, that is that is a very topical question. Um, it is definitely it's two different cultures, um, but they're they're connected, and I think that's part of what makes it really interesting is that we have this therapeutics team that is saddled with a whole consumer team, and I think that there's going to be a very interesting and different way that we're going to be able to think about selling medications and 
educating customers and then again, even being able to target it. So like knowing who actually really should take it. And then also for clinical trials, can you recruit in the right way? So having the two connected absolutely makes sense to me. But, um, and I think there's huge opportunities on both on the consumer side. You know, I think there's a world where no one disagrees. Like some day, every single person is going to have their genetic information and it's going to be integrated into their care. So how is that going to happen? And that's what I see 23andMe is like creating that world where genetics is going to be part of every single person's care. So it's a huge so, market. So do you see yourself as a, on the research side as a drug discovery company? I mean, could you get to the point of building a sales force and creating a fully operational pharmaceutical company? Or are you really mostly interested in the research and the development? I'm interested, of- I'm interested in the sales and marketing because I think it could be done in a different way. And I think that pharma companies today cure and change people's lives and the population on average can't stand them. Yeah. Like and, no and- one loves pharma. And so like, that's kind of my goal is like, that's the, the reason why I feel like I need to control the whole process is because I don't want to be one of those companies where we lose control of how the drug is being delivered. And I think you can do right by the, the consumer. One, one drug company executive once said to me, if you really want to get your drug launched, get it mentioned in the National Enquirer. I'm, I'm dating myself because not many people know who the National Enquirer is anymore. Um, but is there a direct synergy as much as the two businesses feel very different between having this enormous consumer side and, and anticipating a commercial drug business, commercialized I drug business? That- I think there's a lot, I would like to think that there's ways that we could be really innovative. And I think if we have access to large numbers of individuals and we could contact people and we can contact them for research purposes or like let them know about certain condition, you know, therapeutics, like if there's an opportunity for us to have a different way, and I think also a more efficient way of like, how can you actually help people also really understand um, how something's getting into them and also how it's being delivered and how it's priced. Um, I don't know. I mean, look, there's, these are things, these are great problems for us to have in hopefully five years or so. Um, but my hope is to actually be able to change that whole process. And I think it's absolutely true that things like being on the National Enquirer is going to be a great way to market your drug. And I, I feel like there, there has to be better. And like right now, I, I think it's such a tragedy. Like drug names are so hard. Like it's super confusing to the, to the world. Like what, it, what are you supposed to take? And why do we make this assumption that people like really can't understand it and like can't see it? Like, I, I just, I think there's a better way. I heard people make that point that drug companies absolutely name products in, in such a way that you have no idea what they, what they do, no matter how critical they are to people's health. Yeah. And then the so, generic name is impossible to ever say. So you can yeah. never ask for it. So I, I was thinking, as I was thinking about the connection between the two sides of the business, my personal biases are were that um, developing a, a drug, particularly a cancer drug, is much more lucrative than any consumer play. But if you think about the last 20 years, really enormous value creation has come on the consumer tech side. Of, of the world. When we had um, Alex Gorski, mm-hmm. Alex before he left the chairmanship of J&J, like to make the point that of the, of the five companies that had, that had created the most value over the previous you know, X number of years, uh, they were all tech companies except for Johnson & Johnson. And he was proud that J&J you know, rose to that, to that level. Is, is, it, is it too simplistic to think that the research side of the business has a lot more enterprise value uh, potential? Maybe it's really the consumer side that is really going to be the driver of value for... I think it's, I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's like picking a child. Like I, I kind of refuse to pick a child versus I think both of them are full of potential. Um, and in some ways there's therapeutics, again, depending on also what, how lucky we are with... Um, you know, with, with the, with the, the, the clinical studies, 
Um, there's obviously a huge potential there, but there's huge risk. You know, most things in, 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 you know, in clinical studies fail. And so by starting with human genetics, we believe that we are more than two to three times as likely to succeed. So like, we believe we have an edge in that capacity. Um, but consumer, like I said, I, there's a world where we all know every single person should have genetics integrated in their care. And I don't see anyone rushing to do that right now, except for us. So the notion of um, creating enterprise value raises the issue. 2021 was a busy year for 23andMe. Um, you did a public offering via a SPAC. Mm -hmm. Why a SPAC Richard, with Richard Branson SPAC? Why a SPAC? Why that one? And, and, and what do people have to know about the trade-offs between going public via SPAC and a traditional IPO, what are, the, what are the pluses and minuses? Well, you know, it was interesting. It was a little bit of a toss up for us, like which one would we want to do? Um, and frankly, like I really like Richard Branson. He was an early investor in the company, somebody that we've known for a long time. Um, and the SPAC process offers a level of stability and speed that was important to me. And one thing... I have, again, because I spent time on the investor side, I'm like, I'm very clear. Like I'll go into investor meetings and I'm probably one of the few people where like middle of some meetings, I'll be like, you're not the right investor for us and we should leave. Um, Cause you really don't want everyone's money. So in the SPAC process, it was just super efficient. I only spent five days on the road, like in, like in a zoom world, like it was most, like most IPO people would never say that. So for us, it looked like it was all the rage at that time. Um, it was a faster process. Um, it was sort of middle of pandemic. It seemed like, you know, speed was also important. Um, and we really, like, we got incredibly high quality investors. And we're, again, eternally grateful to Richard Branson and his team. It was a great team. So it's now, um, SPAC is definitely a dirty word. Right. And um, so we're still kind of lumped it, even though we're completely despacked. And I would say the one thing I did not realize as much is like there's like this long, um, there's a long road of despacking. Um, but even like we've redeemed our warrant, like everything, like we're we're totally clean, um, and we're still kind of put in this spac category. So when you say you're despacked, what does that mean? Well, you go through because you announce the merger. And then it takes a fair amount of time to close it. And so, you know, we had, um, you know, there was, e e there's a good time where you're, you're trading and, you know, people have the ability to redeem at 10. And so you just kind of, you kind of, are, it's a slow march down to $10. And then you have your day of redemption where investors have the ability to say they want um, their money. They want the $10 instead of taking your stock. And then the day after the day of redemption is the day of regret, where you can say, no, 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 I actually want the stock. So there's a little bit of a wild west element. And then obviously we had warrants associated with it, which you have the ability at, and again, I don't remember the details on it, um, but you, you, you're sort of labeled in this way, like your you're, you're SPAC. And so like, we now have gone through the whole process, closing the merger, you know, Richard Branson SPAC is no longer there. It's entirely 23Me Holding Company and it's, it's, it's done. So that's the process of the, once you announce it, you're sort of in, um, I always joke, it's kind of like you're, you know, back in the day between East Berlin and West Berlin, you're in a little bit of no man's land. It certainly does seem as if the enthusiasm for SPACs has cooled significantly. Had you to do it all over again, would you have, would you do a SPAC again? Would you go think, a more traditional IPO route? I think in, my logic is, is, is usually focused on the same. What is it that is the minimizing? Everything about being public, like investors take a lot of time. And so I'm super, like the most important thing for me and my management team is time usage. So how I spend my time and where I spend my time, I think dictates a lot about the company. So, um, so Today, if I was trying to decide, I would think again about what is the most efficient way of spending my time. And I would say probably today, it's more of an IPO. Well, today the market's closed. So, so again, going back to my first hypothesis, 
speed is very important and time management because you want to get the process done. There's a huge amount of risk, like as you are going through and you're kind of at the whim in many ways about markets, but lots of, I know lots of companies now that were planning to go public and they can't. Like the Has the disenchantment with SPACs affected what you want to do, what you're trying to do? Because a lot of companies yeah. use their, use their, their equity to uh, acquire other companies. Obviously, it's We acquired one. We acquired one health. company. And I think it's, um, no, I mean, for us, we wanted, like, part of the goal also with the SPAC was to make sure that we have enough cash that we're set for a couple of years. So we achieved that goal. You know, I think that was like one of the main things is like, how do we actually have enough cash? And then we had, um, we did do one acquisition and, um, and we're pretty, you know, acquisitions take a lot of work. So we're, 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 we feel pretty set right now. So let me just get to two more questions mm-hmm. and then we'll open up to Q&A. Um, that one acquisition, I take it, is Lemonade Health. Mm-hmm. What is Lemonade? What, what is, who was, what is Lemonade Health and what does it do for you? Lemonade is a incredibly well-run um, U.S. and U.K. company that allows people to get access to care in a virtual world and or telemedicine and allows um, them to get pharmacy. Okay, what? So pharmacy, so medications, pharmacy. so therapies. So what was important for me, for 23andMe, is that if I want to get into the delivery of genomic-based care, I need to have access to healthcare providers who are certified in all 50 states. And I also believe one of the huge untapped potentials is pharmacogenetics meaning like how your medications interact with your genome. And so Lemonade, the other difference, again, just have to emphasize this, um, you know, a lot of like, again, as I talk about my team and you brought up Theranos, like I have a really good team. Like I'm incredibly proud. I have like, I, I will not boast about myself, but I will boast about my team all day long. Like they're really good. And also they're mission driven and they're ethical. Like we're very much of a team that is like fighting the fight for the, for the individual. And so I needed to make sure any company I'm going to acquire, they need to have people who have that same ethos. So Lemonade is very different, especially from like in the world of, of, of telemedicine and online pharmacy that's happening now, like they very much have a mindset where they're always putting the patient first. And also the chief medical officer from there came from Kaiser Permanente, which is again, part of my role model of like, how do you actually really have a care system that is about what is in the best interest of the individual and highly focused on prevention. So, so you, really- you, you mentioned pharmacogenomics, that's still a data play, but Kaiser Permanente, telemedicine are, are really service providers. Do you see a service provision aspect to where mm-hmm. 23andMe can go? Oh, yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we, we rolled out a subscription product uh, last year And I think you can absolutely assume that we will be expanding our subscription product. Part of what we said specifically during the SPAC is that we're looking to expand the subscription. We have this opportunity to deliver care. Okay, so we're we're going to go to the Q and A in just a second. But let me ask you one question. Last year, 2021, you celebrated the 15th anniversary of 23andMe. Where where are you in your journey? Are you at the beginning of the journey? Are you midway through? Have you largely realized? what you had hoped to, to accomplish? I'd say, I'd say we're about 25% of the way in. Like, I think that we have, I'm really excited for the future. Like I'm, I have now all, like, I, I was very excited as well in 2013, I have to say, but like, I have all the pieces in place. Like I have an amazing team and publicly traded. I have healthcare providers. I have pharmacy, I have 12 million plus people. I have an incredible, I have like the world's largest genetic database of that where I can mine for discoveries. Like we're dripping with opportunities. And so I have my therapeutics team that's like like unbelievably productive with GSK. So I feel, um, you know, I want, like, when I think about where will I be, like, where, when when do I start to get to that, like, oh, okay, I'm like at like the 80% mark. It's when genetics 
is really part of everyday care. And you've, like, made, you've made that point a couple of times. Do you think finally, given where you are, that people get it, that people don't think of you as ancestry.com knockoff that or a, a, consumer, a consumer game, a, a, a pure consumer yeah. entertainment play? That was one of the things I was told the FDA said that, you know, you, you should that you can bill yourself as entertainment, but not. Do you think people now get it? Because in addition to product development, it's, you're it's also one of those messaging. things. It's one of those things that's really interesting. Like even at the FDA time, we get criticized for being recreational. Yeah. And then at the same time, I get shut down because I'm so dangerous. Yeah. And I remember telling him, I was like, you can't have it both ways, you guys. Like either I'm like frivolous and leave me alone, or I'm like so dangerous. Like stop telling me that I'm frivolous. And so like, it's really interesting. And depending on the competitor, they kind of take a different angle on us. And the reality is like, you could, I mean, I remember it was really, we were, um, we did this big spit party and it was on the cover of the style section of the New York times. And I remember some of like the senior leaders in genetics calling me, how dare you put genetics on the style section? And I was like, look, man, like a lot more people read the style section than Science Tuesday. And it's like a huge part of 23andMe is like genetics is about your life. It's about you. And you're not just about your health. Like you're interesting. Like all of you are interesting. And like your eye color to earwax to why you can smell the asparagus in your pee to also like your breast cancer risk. Like celebrate all of it. And so like, that's part of it is like, we absolutely want to have fun. So do people go out and talk about their BRCA results all the time or their, their Alzheimer's risk? Like, no, but do they talk about Neanderthal on Facebook? Holy cow. Yes. Like we generate cocktail party conversation and like, we should celebrate that. Like as scientists, like one thing that I absolutely really dislike, again, from my Stanford upbringing scientific arrogance of like, I got a degree and I got a coat and you can't necessarily understand it. Like scientists will never be well-funded. NIH is never going to have a great budget. If you can't generate enthusiasm from the mass population, like we have a responsibility to make everyone like in that fourth grade mentality of like the world is fascinating. It's so fascinating. And so like get everyone excited about it, but you got to translate it for people. And so 23andMe is like on the forefront. We're like, like, we're like the militia in the front lines, like getting people like learn about genetics and science is cool and you can do it. Well, you certainly convey that sense of something fascinating and interesting and wonderful going on. You've built a great company. Uh, we thank you for... Uh, talking to everybody. And I'm gonna turn the program over to Andrew and Josh now, or maybe just Andrew, who is going to take us through some Q&A. Oh, good. Hey. Or, or Josh. I don't hey, know Josh. Actually, Josh. I'll start off. Um, and that was awesome, man. And I'm okay. just excited um, for the inspiration that you are giving all the entrepreneurs and uh, innovators that are listening. And there were so many good questions here and we're definitely not going to get to all of them, but there was one that just popped in that I actually think is super interesting and I'd love to hear your response to it. What do you think of the proteomic space and how does it compare to 23andMe's space in terms of difficulty versus potential? And is that an area of potential interest for 23andMe? It's... Um... It's absolutely. So one of the companies back in the day, like back in 99, 2000, when I was investing, one of the ones that I was also an investor in was proteomics. There's a number of areas that I invested in in 99, 2000 that are all coming back. So one was like genetics, genetic-based drug discovery, Invitae, Millennium, all these companies. There was a proteomics company and then xenotransplantation. All of them died in that time frame, And it's just a kind of a reminder to everyone, just because something dies then doesn't mean it's a bad idea. Like gene therapy as well, all got shut down. So, and I remember a scientist telling me, it was actually um, 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 the CEO of ISIS, which now has changed his name to Ionis. Um, all good ideas, it's a kind of a 20 year cycle. So you just like ideas come, they're like, you realize they're harder. They take a lot of money, it takes time. It's like the passion, you know, really push it forward. And we're kind of at that point with proteomics. Yeah. But do you think, I think would you, are you, have you thought about 
Oh, absolutely. It's just too expensive. Proteomics on top of your database and what that yes. would bring to the, to the whole. I think the things, the way we make decisions, um, I would absolutely like in my dream world. And if I had unlimited budgets, I would say like, I'm going to collect blood on all my customers and I'm going to run proteomics analysis. So the challenge for 23andMe, like part of the way that we scale is that we sell a service to individuals, but I have to give something meaningful back. Mm-hmm. And so Right now, I can't really give you anything meaningful back in proteomics, and it's really expensive. So similar to also microbiome, which like I would love to do microbiome, but like, and we didn't even talk about that because you talked about Theranos, there's other frauds there. Like we haven't offered microbiome because I can't give anything honestly back to my customers. So I can potentially tell them like, hey, you have like some different bacteria, but like it's meaningless. Like we don't know yet. So everything for us in our mind is like, is it just a purely a scientific project? And if so, then the onus is on us to pay for that and do it. So we can do small scale proteomics. And frankly, it's really expensive still, but if it does become, and at some point it will be cheap enough that I could offer a product to my customers, it'll be a combination of genetics, proteomics, and other kind of lab mark, like other biomarkers, that's going to be amazing. So hundred percent, we are definitely all over it. And there's some great companies to watch. That's a great framework. Andrew? Uh, yeah, when, there's no chance that we're getting in the next two minutes, Josh, we're going to get to any of these ex- additional questions. But then I, I have to say, I, it was like a wow moment when you were talking about changing the care delivery model. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you? Did I hear that you're, it's almost like, can you see the world where we skip the physician and go, hey, go straight to one of your customers and say, we've got the drug for you? What do you? I think that... Like I sometimes tell my kids, like, like when mom back in the day wanted to go to Paris and I had to want, go on to go to a hotel, I had to pick up the phone and call them. And my kids are like, whoa, why would you do that? I'm like, because there wasn't an internet, like things didn't scale. It wasn't automated. And so there's something similar in healthcare. Like, frankly, why do I have to go to a doctor to get a blood order? So one of the other first companies that I ever invested in was a company called Neuromedical. And Neuromedical took pap smears and they would, it was like the first ML AI company I'd seen. Like they analyzed all the pap smears and they um, said, these are the only 15% that the pathologists need to look at. And there was like wild outrage. Like how could you eliminate the physician in this way? So the reality is like what we're fighting against is the fact that physicians are the gatekeepers to healthcare. But there's absolutely an opportunity for a huge amount of care to not have to go through a physician. Wasn't WebMD part of that story as well? A way of bringing, you know, much more direct consumer involvement in healthcare decisions. Of course, you're supposed to go back to your doctor and ask him or her. But WebMD kind of democratized they democratize the information. And so you can go to your doctor or you might be able to say, I mean, I look at things like a urinary tract infection, like you should just be able to go and get a diagnostic in the store and then take the meds, like things like that. So you, yeah. like WebMD is very helpful at people knowing like, hey, here's my potential list, but you still have to go to a physician. And I think there's, there's absolutely, like I'm very pro-physician, like there's absolutely of the right place for them. It's just that, like, if I ask my dermatologist, she's like, like, yeah, 90% of what I see is like totally not interesting. It's like the same old stuff. Like you could probably have all kinds of algorithms that could diagnose it in a better way. I'm going to stitch together a few questions here because they're all, they're sort of touching on a similar thing, which is, and I'm interested in your view on it. Where is the ethical line? You know, because there one questioner is asking about these startups that are going beyond what 23 and me are doing in terms of recommending embryos based on polygenic risk. And then of course there's the potential that a database like the one you're creating gets into the hands or or is somehow utilized in the sort of the Gattaca, you know, vision of the future where your your tr- total potential is definable based on your genetic code and you're going to be a, you know going to go do mail handling because that's all you can do and you can't be an astronaut, you know? So like, but where in your, in your mind, like, what are the, what, where's the line? 
Like what is, what, what, and what defines that line? I'm sure you, you've had a lot of time to think about that. It's interests. I mean, look, I think that there's this, like, to me, this is where ethicists should be focusing mm-hmm. rather than on trying to decide, like, is this direct to consumer or not? Like the ethics world is a hundred percent like polygenic risk scores for embryos. Um, and I would argue that there's some data that's just really, there should be some kind of scientific standards about like really how ready is this? Like how predictive is it? I mean, you, there are all kinds of standards, but like, when do you actually start to use that? So you know, one thing, like we always joke, Gattaca hasn't come up for at least 10 years now, but Gattaca is always an interesting movie because again, it's a movie where you're sort of limited based on your genetics. But the reality of the story is like the guy was limited based on his genetics and he proved them all wrong. So in some ways, it's actually a great story of like you, your genetics is not deterministic, your environment, your willpower, like all of this has a huge impact on you. Like there was a really interesting but disturbing movie called Three Identical Strangers. Yeah. Oh yeah. That yeah, that's amazing. I mean, documentary. Like, yeah, and that's where there is, you know, your environment matters a lot. Right. And so I think a lot about that, like helping. And I would say one of the fallings, one of the shortcomings right now of healthcare is that we don't have great ways of measuring your environment, mm-hmm. and that has changed now with telemedicine. Like one thing one company I recently talked to, they're like, the first thing we do is not like heart, you know, blood pressure and all this. Like we take a picture of the refrigerator. We ask them to show us their stairs. We look at the slip mats underneath the rugs. Like, are they going to fall? How far, like their location, are they like in a smoggy area or how far are they away from a store? Like all of those things matter a lot. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great response. So we're have- going over maybe one last question. Mm-hmm. Is that all right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's let's change the tone a little bit. I've been really super impressed. So thank you. So let's turn it around. What words of wisdom would you give a young person starting off their career? It's a question I asked Josh a couple of months back. You know, it's kind of what I um, what I started. Like I said, I graduated college. I drove cross country, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I, but I knew I wanted to do something that I loved. So um, that's why again, I, I recommend it, like temping, like trying on lots of jobs is amazing. The number one thing I advise people to do is like, don't be afraid of quitting because so many people, and I have so many friends in this situation where they're like, oh, I need the stability. I need this. And you never can figure out what your passion is if you don't allow yourself to try on different things. And some of them you don't like. And so like, and that's okay, but like, that's what you, you're never going to figure that out if you don't try and in some ways like fail, like move on. But there was lots of things, like I said, like, I'm not a good bench scientist. I would never, like, I'm not, you know, like, I'm not great. Like I hate, I'm sorry for that. I hate yeast genetics. I think it's so boring. Like when I took genetics in college, I was like, I'm really sorry. I'm not even going to study this. Like, I just, I'm not interested. Like I didn't do well in the course. And so like, part of it is like, you can't let like, it's good to understand what you're good at and everyone is good at something. So I think the main thing is like for people to figure it out, like until you have that passion and once you have the passion, it's so easy. Cause you're like, it's not work for me. It's like, I love what I do every single day, but you have to find your passion. You can only find your passion if you keep trying different things. And the worst thing ever for me, like I, I encourage employees actively. If they tell me they're not learning anymore, and they want to try something, I'm like, then quit, like move on. Like life is too short, like push yourself. Fantastic advice, Ian. <laughs> Thank you for the time that you've spent. It was so fun. Me. And uh, it was really a true pleasure. And, oh, good. Uh, you know, good questions. You, David. David, great job as well. And um, well, we look forward to seeing where you, where you go and it's been enlightening and inspiring. Thanks for the time. Good, good. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to see all these budding entrepreneurs and what they're going to do. So go and quit your jobs and do something awesome. (laughs) Tell your parents I said so. (laughs) Thank you so much. All right. Thank Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.